Welcome back to Flourish. I am so excited to be gathering together again. I missed you guys so much uh, from last spring. And if you're watching today online, I wanna welcome you. You know, we, we launched Flourish at Work last semester so that you could connect with the heart and the vision and the values of milestone women from your workplace. And so I'm so glad that you're tuning in. It's just taken off like crazy. So apparently that was a, a big need out there. So I'm so glad that you're connecting with us today. And, and I also wanna thank you if you are a table leader or a volunteer. We've been doing this for years and we could not do it without the volunteers that come early, stay late, park in the far corners of Keller. <laughs> One day, not too long from now, we will not have this problem. Um, yes, it's exciting, yeah. Parking lot, woo! <laughs> it's so exciting. Um, but really, you really set the, set the platform and the place for women to come and connect. And so I just want you to know that I'm so thankful for your sacrifice and everything you do to make this happen. So, um, but my heart for women here is to flourish. And I know that sounds redundant because we call it flourish. And we've had different topics over the years, but from the very beginning, my heart was to create an environment that we could come together, women from all different walks of life. You know, we're not cookie cutters of each other and we have different strengths and weaknesses and things that we love and motivations and we have different um, family dynamics, but to have a place where we could come together and connect with the other women that love Jesus and be encouraged, encouraged to walk out our faith, encouraged when we're down, encouraged when we're not feeling like, um, loving our husbands or, or continuing on with you know, those, those hard things with our kids and continuing to press in, that you have somebody that you link up arms with that says, you've got this, you can do it. And so I love that you ladies have actually taken that and you have connected with other women and you are flourishing in life. And I wanna provide a place continually that we can reach out to other women and women can come in and feel like this is a place where I can connect, get filled up and go out and live my God-given life purpose and, um, and potential in life. But you know, the definition of flourish is to grow or develop in a healthy or vigorous way, especially as a result of a particularly favorable environment. And here at Milestone, we believe when you're planted in the house, which should be a favorable environment, and you connect with other women, and you're growing and learning, you can make a difference. You can make a difference in your community, in your homes, in your workplace, and that we really are better together. We really are. So this year's theme, as Rachel said, is Women Who Flourish. And I really wanna strategically and systematically take you through six things I think that are vital for women to flourish in life. Things that when I sit down with my daughter that I really want her to know, things I want her to understand about God, about life, before she leaves my house and goes out into the world in a couple of years. Things I would tell her, things that if I were sitting down with you at coffee and you said, Brandy, tell me some main things that I need to know that would help me flourish in life. These are the things I would tell you. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about things such as identity, our home life, family, health, stress, priorities. But today we're gonna start with what I think is foundational to all of that, and it's our perspective. It's the way we see things. How many of you know perspective influences so much of our life? I read a story the other day that I thought was funny and I wanna share with you. It says a lady, a young lady wrote home from boarding school. Dear mom, I'm so sorry I haven't written sooner. My arm's been broken. I broke it and my left leg when I jumped from the second floor of my dormitory when we had the fire. We were lucky. A young service station attendant saw the blaze and called the fire department and they were there in minutes. I was in the hospital for a few days, but Paul, the service station attendant, came to see me every day. And because it was taking so long to make my dormitory livable again, I moved in with him. He's been so nice to me, I must admit I'm pregnant. But don't worry, we're gonna get married just as soon as he can get a divorce. I hope things are fine at home, I'm doing fine and I will write more when I get the chance. Love your daughter, Susie. P.S., none of the above is true, but I did get a D in math and I flunked chemistry. So I just wanted you to get this news in its proper perspective. So perspective is understanding something because you see things from a larger frame of reference. It's the ability to perceive things and how they're interrelated and judge their comparative importance. Like getting a D in math is not nearly as bad as most of those other things that they said, you know? So it's like, oh, okay, you know? 
But in a spiritual sense, it means that we see life in light of God's word, okay? We call it a biblical worldview. So we see life, the way we look at things, we view it through the lens of God's word. The opposite of biblical worldview or perspective, when we're not seeing things through the light of God's word, is hardness of heart, blindness, dullness. Those are the things that happen when we're not looking through God's word and that lens and perspective. Our perspective is off. It's kind of like every Sunday when Jeff says, turn to your Bible. And every Sunday, I turn to my Bible and nothing, nothing but a blur. I can't see a thing until I put these trusty little glasses on right here. (laughs) And then everything comes into perfect view. Except a couple of weeks ago when I put my glasses on and I still couldn't see anything. So I I text one of the pastors, I'm like, I know I'm 40, but really, like I'm actually over 40, but we'll we'll just start with 40. Um, (laughs) 40 sounds better. Um, I know I'm, you know, over 40, but um, are my eyes getting worse? Like I opened my Bible and I put my glasses on and I still can't see anything. And he said, no, the light above your chair is out. I thought things were going downhill fast. But Luke says, in Luke chapter 11, 34, it says, the eye is the lamp of the body. When your eye is clear, spiritually perceptive, when your eye is spiritually perceptive, focused on God, your whole body also is full of light, benefiting from God's precepts. Your whole body is full of light, benefiting from God's precepts. When I'm focused on God, I can see clearly, my body is full of light, and I'm benefiting from God's precepts. But when it's bad, when I'm not focused on God, I'm spiritually blind, and my body is also full of darkness, devoid of God's word. So it's important that we see things the right way, and that we see things through God's lens. Because notice what it says, basically, is what you focus on, you get full of. What you focus on, you get full of. It's perspective's important. The way we see things is important because basically, The way we see things, the way we live our lives is based on our perspective of life. So often, perspective is actually more important than reality because perspective becomes our reality. Does that make sense? So let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter three, verses one through four. Because this is nothing new. Lacking perspective. It's nothing new. As a matter of fact, this was from the beginning. It goes all the way back to the garden. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, and I want you to catch this, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat from the fruit of the tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So he said to the woman, you're not gonna die. He just said that. He made her start questioning what God really said. The enemy's objective was to change Adam and Eve's thinking about God and his ways. Basically, his intention was to drive a wedge between God and his creation, his people. He knew that you know, the man and woman would, wouldn't support anything that would be an all-out assault on God, but he tried to trick him. And he said, I'm not gonna make it all out an assault on God, but I'm just gonna make him question God a little bit. So he subtly deceived them by making an offer that didn't appear entirely anti-God. It, it appeared reasonable, desirable. In 2 Corinthians 11:3, 3, it says, but I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may be somehow led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So we still struggle with this today. Satan deceived Eve by causing her to question the goodness, the love, the motives of God. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The implication was, has God put restrictions on your freedom? I mean, he must not really want you to be happy, right? And then he lied to her about the consequences of disobeying God, you won't die. He totally contradicted what God had already said. And he promised her she would be able to decide for herself what was right and what was wrong, knowing good from evil. But God had already told Adam and Eve what the truth was. And Satan said basically in essence, that's his opinion. You can decide for yourself 
what's right and what's wrong. So he deceived Eve by causing her to make a decision based on, get this, what she could see, what her emotions and her reason told her to be right, even when it was contrary to what God had already said. How many of you know we still fall into that today a little bit? Now, last time I checked, there were no serpents running around. Because you say, Brandy, how does that really affect me? I mean, there's, there's no luscious garden around me, and there's no serpents walking around. And I'm telling you right now, if a serpent actually walked up to me, I hate snakes. There, I wouldn't listen to him. He wouldn't have time to get a word out. <laughs> I mean, as a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, I was at my parents' house, and I was sitting in a lawn chair, but not one of those hard chairs, but a chair that you really sink into, like you're fully committed like to get up, it's an act of Congress, you know, and it's not like the ladylike get up, it's like you're climbing out of the chair. And my son was there and he, we were kind of outside hanging around and he saw a snake in the flower bed and he thought it would be funny to throw the snake at me. <laughs> Sounds hilarious, doesn't it? So he threw it at me and it landed on my chest, right here. Let me just tell you, for a millisecond before I took that thing and flung it across the yard and got out of that chair faster than you've ever seen anybody get out of a chair like that and went after my son, but I couldn't fling him. He's way bigger than me, so, but I thought about it. The serpent would, there would be no words, right? And I could go to Central Market today and buy any fruit I want. I could buy the most exotic fruit, the weirdest fruit, the most expensive fruit, and you know what? God's not gonna be mad at me. So how does this apply to me? How does the enemy come to us today? You know, I don't think... He comes to us in physical form so much anymore, but I think he comes to us disguised as things like the New York Times bestseller, culturally relevant magazines, radio and TV broadcast that we soak in. What are you saying? What are you saying? It's truth, it's truth, it's truth, it's truth. Whatever you say, I'm gonna believe. Blogs, we're in a blog happy society these days, right? Not that all blogs are bad, but we have to take them as somebody's opinion, not as truth all the time, and social media posts by people we may or may not even know. That all of a sudden, people that we don't even know, all of a sudden they have this platform to air their opinions as so-called experts on everything from weight loss, to cooking, to marriage, to parenting, to, I mean, you name it, to social, um, social issues or political ideations or candidates or, or church. And next thing you know, you hear them and you start reading it and you look at it and you think, mm, well, that sounds good. That kind of is soothing to my ears. Tell me more. That sounds like something I believe and I've been looking for somebody to agree with what I believe. And now you have a platform and you wrote it down and you even put a scripture in there. So now I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna soak it in as the truth because I wanted to believe that. So now I'm going all in with that, that thought process. And subtly, what happens is causes us to question what we've clearly heard from God. The enemy, disguised as worldly wisdom, plants seeds of doubt in our mind about what God really said. Does this make sense? Do y'all see how this correlates back to Eve? He tricks us into to questioning, did God really say that? I mean, because does he really want you to be happy? Is he putting restrictions on your freedom? Hmm, sounds familiar. And most of the time he starts not with like all out big lies or the big things, because again, if it was an all out assault on God and anti-God, we would be like, oh no, no, no. But it's the small things, it's the subtleties. The, the things we don't really think matter that much. But in the end, one compromise, one wrong belief, um, one falsehood, it just leads to another and another and another. It's, it's a slippery slope. But not that, not just that. I mean, he does outright lie to us, but there's these half-truths that have a little bit of God in them. That scripture that's thrown in there, that, that one scripture that I pulled out of the entire Bible to support my point. And let me just tell you, a half-truth that's not completely anti-God, but it's definitely out of context of what God said will put you in bondage just as sure as a whole lie. And there's a lot of half-truths floating around today. Okay, y'all, and, and, I know this is sounding kinda, y'all just keep smiling at me, okay? <laughs> so how do we know? How do we know if we're being lied to? How do we know if we're buying in to things that we hear and that we see and that we read? And how do we know if it's a lie? How do we know if it's truth? What is truth? John 8, 31 and 32 says, to the Jews that had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. 
So if you hold to my teachings, the Bible says, you're really my disciples, you're really my followers, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But how many of you know we have this beautiful thing called emotions? And emotions can lead us astray. But when we trust what we feel to be true over what we know to be true, we allow the enemy to deceive us. What we read or hear may sound right, feel right, even seem right. But if it's, listen to this, if it's contrary to the word of God, it's not right. It's just not right. John 14, six says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is a person. And we wanna know truth, and we wanna know the closer we are to Jesus, the more we understand the truth of who he was and what his word says. So we wanna draw in, we wanna draw close to Jesus. So you say, okay, Brandy, I, I get it. Like we're being deceived, like we read things. You know, there's been a cultural revolution. There's been a cultural war. And it hasn't happened overnight. It's happened over generations, over decades, that things just subtly start changing and things get in our mind. And the enemy is, is, is not in a hurry. He's patient. And he'll take his time to just subtly change our mindset. Because again, if we, just, if we went from here to here, in one step, we probably wouldn't make that step, but would, would we make little steps along the way that get us to believe lies, things that are really not true and they're really not in line with God's word? So you say, well, how do I change my perspective? How do I embrace what I know to be true? How do I, how do, I do that? Sometimes you just, things seem right, they, they sound right, and, and how do I not um, just go all in with that? Well, you know, I think number one, the number one way that we can flourish in our perspective and get a proper biblical worldview is to understand that what makes us beautiful makes us susceptible. And you say, Brandy, what do you mean? What do you mean when you say what makes us beautiful makes us susceptible? You know, the enemy strategy is nothing new. Way back in the garden, you know, the, a lot of theologians believe that there was something about the way that Eve was created that made her more vulnerable to deception, inherently more temptable or seducible. But I think his strategy is simple. He knows that if he can get us as women to believe what he's saying, to listen to the lie, that will influence everyone around us and set a pattern for generations to come. He knows that if we buy into what he's saying, if we lean in, as we do, we're women. One of our friends says something, we lean in and we listen. If we lean in and listen and we start believing what he tells us, that we will influence everyone around us. And this isn't a statement about women being weak. Please don't hear that. As a matter of fact, women are beautifully emotional, right? And nurturing and influential. And it's much more about the fact that the enemy understands our ability to influence those around us more than it is an indictment against us. It's funny, my son actually was reading my message last night. And because, um, I don't know, he's, he's a pastor's kid, what can I say? And so he was looking at it and he said, okay, mom, so what, you're tr what are you trying to say here? He said, it sounds like what you're trying to say is there's a target on women's backs. Like we y'all are going around with a target on your back for the enemy. And I said, absolutely. It's exactly what I'm saying. Because he knows our influence. Personally, <laughs> I know if I get passionate about something, I will influence everyone around me to go to my dry cleaners if I love them. <laughs> like you, this dry cleaners is the best dry cleaner. Man, their prices are good. They do amazing. They're fast. They help you. Like you should go to this dry cleaners. If I, if I go to a new restaurant, and it was amazing. I'm like, everybody on the planet is gonna know about that restaurant. Sometimes my husband's like, quit. Now we can't even, there's a line at the restaurant. We can't even get into the restaurant. Quit telling people about stuff. And I don't know if y'all ever watched that. Okay, this is going way back, but they made a remake of it. Um, my Big Fat Greek Wedding. Y'all remember that? I haven't seen the second one. But the first one, I, this is, I don't remember another line out of the whole movie, but I love this line. The woman says, my husband is the head of the house, but I am the neck that turns the head whichever way I want it to go. <laughs> yep, <laughs> we have influence. And I think the enemy is smart, and he knows that if we lean in, if we listen, if we buy in, we'll influence everyone 
around us. So we have to understand, and we have to be smart to his strategy, and understand and identify what's not truth. And then understand how the picture gets distorted, because sometimes it starts out with a good thought. Well, that sounds good. It sounds like it might be kind of God, but it's a subtle deception that gets us thinking something that really is off track. You know, John 8, says, if you wonder what the Bible really thinks about it, it's like, why, please don't hold back. The devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. <laughs> Tell me what you really think. If he's speaking, if, he, if you're leaning in, he's lying. If his mouth is open, he's lying. If it's not God, he's lying. Because he knows that if we lean in and listen, not only will we be in bondage, everyone around us will. So what ways, practically, what ways does the enemy attempt to lie to us as women? What are some lies that maybe we fight on a daily basis? I think the first is, and y'all might be mad at me when I say this, but just hold on and listen to the whole thing first. I deserve to be happy. You say, Brandy, what are you trying to say? I don't deserve to be happy. Let me qualify. The Bible says that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, that God loves us immensely, enough that he sent his son to die on a cross to save us so that we could have eternal life. God loves us immensely. But when you look through the pattern of the Bible, you realize that there are people like Moses. Moses is a beautiful story of redemption, but just because God had a plan from birth when all the baby boys were being killed and his mom put him in a river and a princess picked him up and he was raised in a palace, that sounds amazing. Right up until like, oh, well, what happened? Now he has to flee the palace. Now he's gotta go back to Pharaoh and what, what's gonna happen? And Pharaoh's gonna harden his heart. And then Pharaoh's gonna let him go and he has all these people following him, but then all of a sudden Pharaoh's gonna change his mind and he's gonna chase him with the intent to kill him. And then they come up to the, you know, the Red Sea and they're sitting there and they're like, oh my gosh, we're gonna all die. And, and then everybody's questioning Moses and what did you do to us? And next thing you know, God performs a miracle and Moses is like, thank you, God. And then they get on the other side and then everybody's grumbling and complaining. Next thing you know, he goes up on the mountain and they're all building idols to another God. And you're like, really? Think about Moses' life. Do you think it was all happy or was it a process of God shows up? God is on my side. God is for me. Everything is not always easy. I don't always feel happy, but God is there. Think about Esther. Esther was in a palace. She was living the good life right up until she found out that her people were gonna be annihilated. Now, she had a choice to make. She could have saved herself and not said anything and let her people be annihilated, or she could speak up, risk her own life, which was actually in her thought process is probably more probable that she would die in trying to save her race but she could do what God had ordained for her to do and step out and think about others rather than herself. She chose to step out and what happened, God met her and he saved her. Beautiful queen, but she had to make a choice to do not what felt right to her, but to do what God had ordained her to do, but God showed up. Think about Daniel when he refused to bow down like everyone else in the world was doing. Everybody else was doing something different, but Daniel stood up for what was right, and he was thrown in a lion's den. But what? God closed the mouth of the lion. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, thrown into the fiery furnace, yet God was in there with them and walked through it with them, and they came out unscathed. Think about Paul. He was shipwrecked. He was put in jail. The Bible says he had a thorn consistently in his side, something that consistently bothered him. We don't know what that was, but again, if it's, the Bible has to mention it, you know it's probably annoying at the very least, right? Yet he said, whether I'm in plenty or want, I choose to be content in my life. And I know you think, well, Brandy, yeah, that, that sounds great, but the way that plays out is a lot harder because I just, I just wanna be happy, but happiness is fickle. What makes me happy today might not make me happy tomorrow. I know several years ago, about seven years ago, actually, um, when we were actually moving into this building, and this building was such a blessing, it still is a blessing, and we were having our big Easter celebration, and it was the grand opening of the church, and everybody was excited. 
And a few weeks before that, I had lost a friend who died suddenly at the age of 29. A friend that helped us plant this church and a friend that was close and, and she was going to check on her baby and had a heart condition she didn't know about and she just, she just died suddenly. And a few weeks after that, I was in my second trimester um, of pregnancy and I lost a baby two days before the grand opening of this church in the a big Easter celebration. And I remember feeling deep, deep sorrow. Those were two big things that happened that year, but there were a lot of bad things. It just seemed like a year of sorrow in so many ways. Just a lot of bad things were happening. And you come into an environment, everybody is praising and they're excited, and all I could do was weep. I was so down, I was so discouraged. And I remember just a day before that, two nights before that, I had lost the baby and I had to go in for a procedure so they could clean out my womb and take the remains of the baby out. And I remember being in fear. Okay, God, my friend died, my baby died. I know you loved all of them. What's gonna happen to me? And I remember being so scared. Nothing felt happy. I wasn't in control. And I, I don't like to think I'm a controlling person, but I do like to be in control and I couldn't control anything that was going on. And I just was anxious and, and just out of myself. And my husband was just, quoting scriptures over me, and I woke up in the middle of the night singing a song. And it was part of that amazing grace, and it said, the Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Okay, the Lord has promised good to me. His word, his word, the truth, is where I find my hope. He will be my shield and my portion. I don't have to count on anything around me God is my shield and portion. As long as I'm on this planet, he, he's got me. He's gonna take care of me, it's gonna be okay. And the funny thing is my son was actually writing a paper for um, Bible class. They have to write a paper at one of the hardest times of their life. And he said, Mom, I was young, I was like eight years old when this happened, and I remember that being so sad, but I don't remember all the details. This was just this week, and he said, could you, are you okay with explaining it to me? Like, are you okay with going back through the story? And I said, yeah, son, yeah. I mean, it's been seven years and it's okay. I, we can talk about it. I can tell you the details of what happened. And so I was going through the details and I started weeping. And I said, wait just a minute, because I want you to know that wasn't the end of the story. And I went and got a magazine article that I had written for one of our Keller magazines, you know, the local magazines around here. And it was a two-page article on joy. And I said, I want you to know something. This might have been one of our hardest years but the Lord taught me more about what true joy is in that year than any other year of my life. I said, as a matter of fact, so much so that our Christmas event that we call joy was named, we started it that year, that all of that had happened. And the Lord taught me about what it is to have a joy and a contentment in trusting God and his character and who he is in my life over momentary fleeting happiness. And so I encourage you when I say, well, this lie, I deserve to be happy. Not everything feels happy all the time. But when we understand the truth of who God is and his character, because what I kept telling my husband is, I don't know what's going on and I don't know why, and I still don't know why. But I do know this, God is good and he cannot be contrary to his nature. So even though I don't understand this, I can trust that God is good and that he loves me. So that's the first slide. The second one is maybe, I can't, um, I can't help the way I feel. I can't help the way I feel. Now, okay, girls, like I said, our emotions and sensitivity are part of the things that make us beautiful, part of the thing that makes us so complex, that make us amazingly empathetic when our friends are sad, that we just bawl with them and we cry and we watch a movie and eat brownies with them, or when something great happens that we celebrate and we throw an all-out party. I mean, we go all in and all out in so many ways, but if we're to be honest, our emotions are also what make us a little crazy sometimes. Right, offendable, sensitive, mad for no good reason. And y'all all get guy quiet like you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I know you do. I remember one time I was um, laying in bed with my husband and I had had a bad dream that, I, it, that he did something that made me mad. I don't even know what it was, but he did something that made, it, made me mad. And I woke up and I was mad at my husband. So we're laying in bed, just laying there. And I just look at him and I say, I'm angry with you. I said, I just woke up mad at you. And he's like, I haven't even done anything. I haven't even gotten out of bed. 
And I was like, I know, but you just need to watch out today because I woke up mad and it may not go well for you today. <laughs> Sometimes we're just mad, I can't help the way I feel. And emotions are a part of who we are, but we are not supposed to be led or controlled by our emotions. It is a silly lie to say I can't help the way I feel, that my emotions take over my body and I have no control over what I do or say. That is a lie. We have control over our emotions. We choose the truth. We choose the fruit of the Spirit when we don't feel like it. Now, we're not perfect. We all make mistakes. We wake up mad at our husbands for no good reason. And we have to choose to be nice when we don't feel like it. But the fact that we say, well, it's that time of month. I'm just hormonal. I can't help it. I'm just going to snap at everybody. And I have an all-out past to be ugly to anybody in my path. It's not true. We're to be led by the Spirit of God and nothing else. So that was really quiet. Y'all don't love that. I can tell. <laughs> Sometimes the truth is hard. Y'all just keep smiling so I feel better. Maybe it's I shouldn't have to live with unfulfilled longings. My husband doesn't make me happy anymore. He's not romantic enough. The guy at work listens to me. He gets me. It would be easier for me to just ditch this and do that. I shouldn't have to f live with unfulfilled longings. It's a lie from the enemy. Everyone around me is doing it. Everybody gossips. Everyone tells little white lies. Really? I remember all these stories are about me. I'm hoping I'm just making y'all feel better because I've pretty much lived out all of this. I remember when Jeff and I were dating, he wanted to take me out during the day one day and I worked. And I don't remember why he was off for some reason that day. And he said, hey, let's go out on a date. And I said, okay, I'll just call in sick. And he was like, no, no, don't call in sick. Either call in and tell them that you, you, would, you have something today and you would like the day off. And if they give you the day off, we'll do it. Or if they say no, you just go to work and we do it another time. And I was like so convicted because I'm like, everybody calls in sick, right? <laughs> yeah, y'all are being real quiet now. <laughs> no, because if you lie to your boss about that, it's a slippery slope. If you lie to them, will you lie to me? Right? One little thing snowballs into other things. So we have to reverse the trend. Everybody tells little white lies. Everybody gossips. Everybody. The Bible says if we gossip, we're stealing their reputation, taking away their good name. That's not for us to do. Okay? Okay, let's go. So, so those are some of the lies that we get caught up in as women. So how do we say, okay, so some things I've just been ingrained in from an early age. How do I know if it's my family tradition or things I've heard or things I've listened to? How do I understand how to identify the truth? 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We destroy arguments, things that people give really good arguments about why God's way is not right. And every lofty opinion, every blog post, everything I hear on TV, every lofty, high-thinking opinion that raises itself against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him, rooted, planted, because when you're planted, you flourish, and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith, as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Let me just tell you something else. Thankfulness and gratitude have a lot to do with the way we see life. What we magnify gets bigger. So if we magnify the bad things, they become the biggest thing in our life. But when we magnify God and his goodness and we're thankful, that becomes the overarching theme of our life. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So how do we know, like what do you think Paul means when he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and um, deceptive philosophy? What are some examples of hollow and deceptive philosophy? Now remember, 
We're talking about some hard subjects today. These are the things, if I could sit down with you and say, these are the things that are gonna be important for life. If I was sitting down with my daughter and saying, hey, as you go into this world, I want you to be able to identify and know this, okay? Maybe things like, I was born this way, I can't change. Let me just tell you something. Let me just explain this. We were all born with a sin nature. Every one of us. We were all born with great propensity to sin and sin big. And that's why God's plan for redemption is so beautiful. Because the Bible says that when he comes to live on the inside of me, it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And I don't walk by the flesh, but I walk by the spirit. So I become a new creation in Christ. And he empowers me through his spirit to live in a way that I could never do on my own. So yes, we were all born in sin. We just need to be born again, okay? So we hear that all the time, I was born this way. And you say, oh no, it's not biological, it's not. Yeah, we were all born into sin. Well, I just think what's right for you is right for you. What's right for me is right for me. If it feels good, we should just, and you know what? And I accept what you're doing because I love you. And here, let me just tell you something. Acceptance and love are not equal. I can love you so much that I couldn't possibly accept what you're doing because I know that you are going to run off a cliff and it's going to kill you. It's not love for me to say, just keep running. Just keep running and run right off that cliff and it's gonna kill you. It's gonna kill your family. It's gonna kill everything. And, and just be like, and I love you so much, I'm gonna let you do that. Not telling people the truth <coughs> is not love. If my kids were about to do something absolutely horrible, in love, I would tell them, that's gonna hurt you. That's not God's plan for your life. God's got better things in store for you. Don't do that. Yes, I love you, but that's not gonna happen, okay? You can't turn back the cultural clock. Maybe not, but this one gal, I can influence the people around me. I can start with my sphere. I might not be able to go out and influence the whole world right now, but I can start with the six in my family and everyone else that I touch because I will influence, if I'm walking in love, in truth, I will influence those around me. You can start there. But how do we know? How do we take those thought captives? How do we, how do we, how do we see it? You know, it's kind of like when you're typing and you misspell a word or you put too many spaces, or if you're like me, you put dot, dot, dot. All my friends that get texts from me know this. I put dot, dot, dot after everything because I don't really want to finish that sentence and start a new sentence. I just want to continue my thoughts, but really, it can't all go in the same sentence, so you just dot, dot, dot it and keep going. And when I look at my documents that I'm writing, I mean, it's like my, my word, perfect, whatever, Microsoft Word is like lit up. In the same way, when something is out of place, when it's not right, it should light up in our head. That's not right. That's not right. When it gets us, it's, if it's something that's gonna get us off track, that doesn't line up with God's word, it should light up like a Christmas tree in our mind. Anything that doesn't agree with God's precepts, anything that needs corrected should stand out. Because when we see things from God's perspective, through the authority of his word, we're able to evaluate everything differently, and we see how God calls us to live. We evaluate everything differently when we look through the light of God's word. You know, Jeff and I run a lot on the trails here in Keller. And a few years ago, a group of local art enthusiasts um, helped to visioneer this whole art in the park concept around the Keller Town Center. And one of the things they did was put these large metal sculptures up all throughout these little um, coves out in the, in the woods. And I remember when they first put this up that it just looked like a jumbled piece of metal. Can you put that picture up for me? Yeah this right here. And I didn't really appreciate it. I'm like, what is this? What are they doing? Like, I love running out here and I love seeing fireflies and smelling honeysuckle. And I had a skunk chase me one time and armadillos crossed my path and I see fox out and I'm like, it's the woods in the city, you know, and now I've got metal and all of that. And I was like, uh. but one day as I was running, I'm just being honest, sorry. <laughs> okay. But one day when I was running, I saw that they had put this scope up because I saw it all going up. And I stepped over and I looked through the scope and I saw something totally different. And it's amazing how all of that 
when you're looking through the right lens, turns into something totally different. You see it in a whole different way. And this is actually a castle in another country that was from you know, gazillions of years ago that Disney actually patterned their castle over. But as I looked through all of the ones in the different areas, I saw the Great Sphinx, I saw the Statue of Liberty, I saw St. Basil's Cathedral in Russia. And I was like, oh. And I actually looked it up and it's called anamorphic art, which is perspective art. It's all about your perspective and having the right perspective and then you can see it clearly. And so once I understood the bigger picture, I could appreciate it a lot more. But when we don't see the big picture, when we're not looking through the right lens, if we don't have the proper perspective, it's all just jumbled up mess that I really don't wanna have anything to do with and don't really appreciate because I'm missing the bigger picture. But the fact is it is important to see the bigger picture in life. If we just look at what's going on in the moment, we will get discouraged, discouraged with our marriage, with our kids, with our workplace, and we start to lose faith in those around us. We just do. We lose faith in God's plan for our lives. We're suspicious of people's intentions. Do they really mean that when they said that? Were they, were they being sarcastic or were they really being nice? I don't, what did they mean when they said that? And we're relegated to our emotions, how we feel when we wake up every day. Rather than living life with joy and contentment the way God intended for us. When we lose sight of why we're really here on this planet at this time in history, which is to love God, love others, and make Jesus famous. When we lose sight of that, when we lose perspective, when we focus on us instead of on Jesus, when we focus on our wants and our desires, we're constantly discouraged. Because we will let ourselves down, and others, again and again and again. But when we view our life through the lens of God's word, and his love for us and his plan for us as his daughters, we're encouraged, we have hope and we have faith that he sees us, that he knows us, and that he'll take care of us. And that we don't just have to survive, but we can live our life and be women who flourish. I want you to bow your heads with me today. And if you're here today and you say, Brandy, I know I've been believing the lies of the enemy and it's affecting my life. It may be affecting my marriage, it may be affecting the way I go to work and the way I see things, it may be affecting my friendships or family relations. And I just, I feel like my perspective is off. Will you pray for me? Pray for me to understand the truth and to see things through the light of God's word. If that's you today, I want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. All heads are bowed and just raise your hand so I can see it because I wanna pray for you. Lord, I just pray right now for the women in here who are raising their hands, God, and those that they can't, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would help them to understand your, your amazing plan for their life and help them to see through your perspective and your lens, God, how much you love us and what you have for us. And Lord, I pray that you would help them, even if they're in trials and difficult circumstances or difficult marriage or in, a, in, a, in an environment where at your workplace you don't feel like your boss understands or you have problems with your coworkers. Lord, I pray that you would help them to understand the truth of your word and walk out according to to your word and your ways, God. Help us not to believe the lies of the enemy that come against us, that would ruin our relationships, our perception of you, God. But help us to embrace your word. Help us to dig into your word. And when those thoughts come to us, Lord, I pray you would help us to take them captive, that they would light up in our mind like a Christmas tree. And we would just take those captive to the obedience of you, Lord, and walk it out. And I pray that you would come in, Lord, yes, that you would fill them with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Help them to feel loved beyond measure and understand because of your great love, you give us your word, your truth, and your perspective. In Jesus' name, amen.